I've been ministering on Jesus. You know, uh, and that might sound funny to you because you might have thought that's what I've been ministering all along, and I would consider that is what I have always ministered on, but really focused over again uh, back, actually years ago, back to the to Jesus, talking about Jesus and trying to bring him into uh, the majesty that he is in and bring him up, elevate him in our thinking. Because if, if he is in his right place in our hearts and minds, then we have less, less difficulty with the things of the world. I think sometimes we get the focus on off of him and we get it on to maybe learning, maybe knowledge, and so uh, maybe that's where we were, and the Lord redirected me back to speak in terms of Jesus, or maybe it, it put him in his proper perspective, but maybe it was that we could better understand the book of Revelation if we understood who Jesus is and what Jesus represents. And so today, again, I'm going to try, you know, my best, uh, but it falls way short of what it deserves to speak to Jesus in his call and ministry, to Jesus in his call and in his ministry. And the scripture uh, reference uh, will be taken out of uh, the book of John. And if you would, if you'd turn with me to John, John chapter 13. John chapter 13, um, well, we could start anywhere. I, that's one of my favorite uh, chapters. You know, this is the chapter where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. How amazing, huh? That God kneels and washes the feet of the disciples. You can see how uh, Peter had some pushback with that and how hard it is to grasp. But then he said, you don't understand right now, but you will understand later. And sure enough, now we can kind of understand what, Christ was referring to Peter, uh, you don't understand now, Peter, but if you don't have any, let me wash your feet, then you have no part in my kingdom. And he said, well, we'll wash all of me. And the Lord says, no, he that's been washed uh, has no need to be washed again, save his feet. And there we get the understanding. And he said, all of you have been washed, but what? But not all of you. <laughs> not, there's one that's not washed, right? So from that, we can get the inference from the Lord that Judas had not been washed, which would mean he had not been justified or regenerated. So some say, well, what about Judas? You know, if, if all were uh, born again and so forth. Well, from Christ's statement that not all of you are washed, we can glean the understanding that most likely Judas was not born again. So the Lord washed all of their feet and he left him out as an exception as to he not, both, not only needed the washing of his feet, which represented walking in after rebirth in the world and getting on you again the dust of this world, but also, there's one of you that hasn't even been washed. So we, that, <laughs> that's for nothing. I, I had not meant to even talk about that. So let's pick it up, that chapter, verse 31, because I think that's very interesting. Oh, I guess it does go together with what I was going to say. John 13, 31, it says, Therefore, when he was gone out, you know who that was? It's gone out, right? Peter, Peter motioned to John who was laying on the breast of Jesus. Who is it that he speaks of is that one? And John asked the Lord, he said to him, that I give the sop or the bread. I think that's a reference back to Psalms 41. He gives him the sop and he eats. And that is, we find that it's Judas and Judas, uh, t having, Iscariot having taken that sop, taken that bread, then Satan comes in to Judas, and they together conspired to go. And the Lord says, what you do, do quickly. In other words, it's go ahead and get out of here. I'll feel much comfort, more comfortable if you're not here. 
So he, he, he dismisses Judas, and then verse 31, he says, Therefore, when he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Let me just say, without, the, without glory, without God being glorified, there would be no redemption. I mean, God only does that which glorifies him. And he glorifies himself in Christ's redemption. And we need to understand that it's not about us. It's about God being glorified. We're his creation. We, he created us. And he does all things for his glory. And so it, it brings, that in itself should elevate in your mind and heart Christ. Because Christ is God. And, and here we have this statement of Christ says, Now is the Son of Man glorified. This is the Son of God, and now the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Not, in other words, not, not, very, not very much longer than right now. I mean, I just dismissed Satan to go do his business. It's his hour, it's his moment. Let him have it, but quickly behind him will be the glorifying of God through me. And when I glorify God, God will quickly glorify me, which he did, obviously, very quickly. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, note there he said, I said unto the Jews. You know, it's as if he's separating himself from the Jews. And he is, in a sense, that religious aspect of the nation of Israel the Jews, the scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees. He is, he's relates to them as to uh, another entity or group. Whether I, I'm, I'm establishing a new group right here among you. This, this group, this group of 11, I am now establishing uh, a new group. Though The Jews are there, but we are here. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one to another. Then Simon Peter said, where are you going to go? And then if you jump to the 14th chapter, verse 5, it says, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, you and I have heard this scripture quoted, probably preached as, many, as much as any uh, sermon text uh, that you've heard. Possibly. And I, I you know, I, I make a feeble attempt to elevate uh, us in a thinking more in line with the higher aspects of this verse and the scripture. And so the text that I take for today's uh, teaching lesson is Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This in response to Thomas's question. He was confused. How, if you don't tell us where you're going, how are we going to know the way to get there? It seems reasonable to his mind, right? It seemed reasonable to them. He was speaking on a different level, of course, a level that they were hardly able to comprehend at that moment. Why? Because they walked in the darkness of Adam's nature. Not that they hadn't been born again, but that yet their souls, their carnal souls, had been more, have were being more controlled by the carnality and the religious mind than it was about a spiritual uh, mind that Christ was trying to impart to them. Jesus, the Son of God, victorious over Satan, death and grave, is the inspiration and the means to come into future close proximity with the Father. The Son of God, the Son of Man being glorified is the means 
his victory over Satan, is the means by which we might be brought into close proximity with the Father. Jesus declares himself the exclusive way to the Father. He's the exclusive way. There's no other way. There's no other way to the Father. Now there's, there's differing opinions as to how one might attain unto, unto uh, regeneration and eternal life. And they all would, though, have to come through Jesus. And I hope to explain that as it relates to Judaism a little bit better in a minute. But here we speak to the Father. We speak not here to Yahweh. We speak not here to Elohim. We speak here to the Father. Jesus declares himself the exclusive way to the Father. Now Israel knew the way unto God as the Almighty. The lawgiver whose glory was hidden behind the veil which we all understand and knew that, know that no man could enter in save the high priest once a year, lest they would die. We understand that, that God hid Moses in the rock when he passed by him. Because never was a man ever brought in to, to the viewing or to the, the closest of proximity to God Never has a man been brought in save the Son of Man, the Son of God. So they knew, Israel knew, knew God, Almighty God, Yahweh. They knew the lawgiver, uh, but his glory was hidden behind the veil. Never was God revealed as the Father in the Old Covenant. Never was the Father revealed in the Old Covenant nor the way into his presence, his close proximity. <clears throat> now, he, he related them to them and called them sons, Israel as their son, but he never did show himself or display himself as the father or a way into his presence as the word father intimates. You know, to know God is one thing, to know Yahweh is one thing, to know the lawgiver is one thing, but to know him as the Father suggests intimacy and close proximity. And the law could never bring them into that kind of proximity. Jesus is distinguished as the truth. How so? How so? I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. How, how is it that Jesus, being distinguished as the truth, how is that so? Well, in that what he speaks. What Jesus speaks is truth. What Jesus does is truth. So he can relate to himself as the truth because what he speaks is the truth in the means by which you or I or any man could ever get in close proximity to the Father. I am the truth. That was John. That was also out of John. Uh, that's John uh, 1, uh, 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So, how so is that what he speaks? That, it, that he is the only way is what? I am the way. When he was speaking to Thomas and also answering Peter's question, when he said, I am the way, how, how, how do we know, uh, you know, first of all, we don't know where you're going. Second of all, how do we know to go there? How, how do we know the way to go there? And Jesus said, I am the way. The way to where? You're the way to where? You're the way to what? I am the way to what was the subject matter? It was the Father. 
the Father is the subject matter to which Jesus is addressing. And he said, I am the truth, I am the way. So I am the way to the Father. There's no other way to the Father than through me. There's many that pretend that they can lead you to God or to the Father, but I am the only way because I am the truth. Everything I say is true and truth. Everything else represented by anybody else that, that, uh, that uh, says or uh, implies that there is another way unto the Father, say through me, is a liar. That's how John went ahead and had, he understood those words as he was laying there and listening here in the last day of his passion, on the, on the first day of his passion, I should say. He quoted those words later and he said that if any spirit says that Jesus has not come in the flesh, he's a liar and he's the Antichrist. Because there is no other way than through Jesus to close proximity with God the Father. So I am the truth because I'm talking all the, to all of you about how to, get to Jesus, uh, how to get to God, the Father. I am the truth because I'm the only one that can tell you how. I'm the way because you can't go any other way than through me. To where? To God the Father. Well, I am the way. To God the Father and to his abode. For God is, through his spirit, everywhere. But he is a person. He is a being that has a location. And that location is in heaven. And wherever close proximity is, is to God as it relates to now, is in heaven. We haven't, we haven't in close proximity entered in to the presence of God. We've entered in through Christ. We access him by voice and heart, but we haven't entered in in our physical being into heaven or even or better said into the close proximity of God. We haven't. Only Christ has. He's the only man that ever has, but he's not the only man that ever will. Because the promise is that you and I will be raised up into heavenly places in close proximity to the Father. And then finally, he says, I am the life. I'm the truth. I'm the way. I am the life. Life. What does that mean? I am the life. He is by him only is the means the spiritual life that he alone may provide. In other words, it takes truth, my preaching, my words to you, on that how to get into close proximity with the Father. It takes truth, and I am that truth, and I'm going to tell you how. Not only am I the truth, telling you how, I am the way how to get in close proximity. And not only that, I am life. And that life is that that I provide you that you might come through me into the close proximity of God. So he's all three. He ministers, he preaches the word of God, he speaks the word of God which we hear and Faith cometh by hearing, and we draw close to him through our hearing. But we understand that the message is that he is the Son of God, and that it is through his atonement, through his propitiation, through what he did, his death and resurrection, that is the way that we can now have a means by which he can provide us life through that atonement, the life of the Spirit of God, that we might at one point in our future destiny be in close proximity to God, the Father. That's why he, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life.
It all has to do with the glory of God. It all has to do with being in close proximity to God. Anybody want to be? Are we so foolish that we would reject this great gospel? Are we so foolish? Are we so dark? Are we so caught up in our darkness and Satan's schemes and so forth that, that we can't see the light? That's, that's John's whole purpose is to magnify Jesus so that he might glorify God. He is the word manifest flesh. He is the light. He is the bread that came down. He is everything. He is the exact express image of God the Father. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. So what we need, I believe, this group, we need to see Jesus' call and ministry that it exceeds that of the Messiah for Israel. Sometimes I think we're in a box. We've limited ourselves. And this is the idea of this message is to lift Jesus into his rightful place at the right hand of the Father as God, the very being God, Instead of thinking in terms of the, uh, Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel. Let me just say, Jesus Christ the Messiah is not even close to what Jesus is. <laughs> okay? Just think about that a minute. Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, is not even close to what Jesus is. And if you've limited him somehow in your mind in thinking he is the Messiah of Israel, and you're seeking after the Messiah of Israel, you sell him short. Far short. He's not even the Messiah of the world as it relates to significance. He far exceeds in significance the Messiah of the world. I'm telling you that Messiah of the world exceeds Messiah of Israel. <laughs> Israel is one nation. God is not the, the God of one nation. He's not, uh, he's not only the God of, of the one nation, He's the God of the world. And Jesus is not only the Savior of Israel, He's the Savior of the world. But you know what? That still falls way short of what Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is the manifest Son of God. The Son of God is far higher and exceeds the calling that we've known Him under. The calling that He now sets before us is much higher than the Messiah of Jesus, of, or the Messiah of Israel. And it's much higher than the Messiah of the world. It is the calling of the Son of God. It is His call and ministry as the Son of God that we should be looking to and hearing because He is the way, the truth, and life. To what? Being saved? No. To fullness of God's salvation plan that exceeds what we have been taught or thought. It's all scriptural. It's all in the Word. There's nothing outside of the Word that I bring out. In other words, his position is much higher than that of Messiah. His position is much higher than Savior. Can you see that? Just, just, just thinking on that just a minute, can you see? Jesus is, his position is higher than Savior of the world? My goodness, he can blink and destroy this, this whole earth and every man that's in it in a blink. It would not affect him in any way. He, he is still what he is without us. <laughs> his significance doesn't stem around us. It stems around him. It's his glory. It's his son's glory. That's what we are working in, hopefully, in harmony, in cooperating with Christ's Spirit in that we would bring the glory to the Father through Jesus Christ. That's, that's the, the weight. That's the weight of the world. I mean, the weight of the Word. It's the weight of the Word. 
It's, it's the white between the black. He's fully accomplished what, what he intended to do as it relates to Savior of the world. His work is complete. He's finished. He, he has done the work. And as it relates to Israel, he has accomplished that, but he hasn't fully brought it into being. He hadn't fully manifested the salvation of Israel, but he has done that. And he will restore them, and they will receive him as the Messiah. But his calling, he, that that we should hear in his ministry, that that we should enter into, is that of the Son of God. I want that to hit home. His call and his ministry is that, not of the Messiah, not of the Savior of the world, but as the Son of God. The Son of God manifest, manifest in the flesh unites God with man. Jesus, the Word of God, made flesh, unites God with man. And he unites God with man beyond the law of Moses. Or even the pre-fallen man of Adam. I see the wheels turning. I'm saying that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to which we are looking for the calling and the ministry, the Son of God unites God with man. And that far exceeds that which the law of Moses was was accomplishing and where however however connection was being made between God and man through the law of Moses however that connection was being made that's insignificant compared to God in the flesh manifest as Jesus Christ are you with me in, does, is that making any more sense to you and I'll take it another step, and I said, this uniting of God with man through Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh not only exceeds whatever uniting there would have been in, in the law of Moses, but it actually supersedes and goes above that which, would have, which was represented in pre-fall Adam. In other words, do you see it? In other words, to make it, try to make it even clearer, whatever God's purpose in making man, He said He made him in His image and in His likeness. That was a unity of some sort. But, and it exceeded the unity of that of the Mosaic Law, whatever unity that that could bring about. But Christ being manifest in the flesh as a son of man far exceeds what it was that God made Adam in his image. Does that help? What am I doing? I'm speaking to you of how he is the truth, the way, and the life. I'm speaking to you in his majesty where we have short-souled short him. We haven't put him in his rightful, elevated place in heart and mind. We've limited him in his scope and position because we haven't rightly divided and understood the word of God. And if we can rightly divide the word of God and we can rightly put Jesus 
in his right place in our hearts, we'll have the reverential fear necessary to ward off all the evils of this world, plus some. Plus some. We'll even kick off the throes of death. If we can grasp, if he'll allow us to grasp, because he has to give us ears. He's got to give us eyes. Well, he's got to give us hearts to comprehend. Because if he doesn't give it to us, we're not going to be able to grasp it. But if you've laid a good enough foundation, if your will is to do his will, he can reveal to, him, to you and I the majesty of his calling in the ministry of the Son of God. And that's my heart's desire, is to see him and reflect him as an ambassador, as he really is. Not some religious phenomenon, not some, some uh, facade that uh, has no substance. You know, man, the realm of man as it relates to him being made in the image of, of God was earth. The realm of man as it relates to God and him making him in his image is earth. Are you with me? I'm trying to say how, how high the calling is in the ministry of the Son of God. And had him being manifested in the flesh, John 1 1. John 1 1. How he was manifested in the flesh, the Word of God. How the, that far exceeds the, the man's position in the law of Moses or even back to the pre Adamic world, because in those two arenas, his position, man's realm, even in the image of God, was limited to earth. But now, somehow, this Son of God calling and ministry is lifts him out of his own uh, world or own realm of the earth into a heavenly sphere. How much higher a calling is this that the Son of God has as opposed to the law of Moses? <laughs> there is just no comparison. I just don't know how to paint the picture as vividly as I sense it in my heart. That's the, that's the bottom line here, is that, that we have not put Christ as the Son of God as much as we've put him as the Messiah. And it, it doesn't, the Messiah of Israel focused more on the, the earthly ministry than it does on the heavenly ministry. And the focus also takes us over into more of an earthly kind of approach than the one that he holds out for us, that if we could hear and see the word and rightly divide it, we would see a much grander, greater, higher calling and position in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The heavens and the earth are the sons of God. The heavens and the earth are the sons realm. The sons of God's realm. The excellence of, call, of the calling is found in the excellence of his previous being. In the beginning, right? He was with the Father. And he rejoiced in all the Father's hands. And, he, and all things were made by Christ. And in him all things exist. That's his excellence of his previous. This Son of God calling is, is, is something higher than what we've looked at because it has to do with the excellence of his being before he came down and was manifest as the Son of Man. He's not, he's, not, he's not limited as he was limited in, to man in the spoken word. Here, 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 this, takes, this takes some spiritual ears to, to grasp this and to catch this. In the old covenant, and before, I'm talking before Moses, in the Abrahamic covenant, before that, 
the, the, the spoken word after Adam, the spoken word was limited. It was limited in that it could just save man. It could justify man, but it couldn't bring him back into close proximity with God. I'm talking about the spoken word. Are you with me? The spoken word. Before the, the word became flesh, it was what? It was the spoken word. And the spoken word could only go so far as it relates to man's salvation. It could save him, it could justify him, but it couldn't bring him back into the garden. There wasn't enough efficacy in the propitiation to bring him back into close proximity. And the only way that he could get back into close proximity is have a higher grade of blood. Soul for soul, blood for blood. And the spoken word didn't exercise its own blood. It exercised the blood of an animal. Take the animal and cut its throat and sprinkle its blood. Are you with me? So the spoken word of God limited God as it relates to man and his realm to justified and kept him in the realm of the earth. If not on the earth, in the earth. Dust you are, and dust you shall return. That wasn't God's plan. But that's the way it, it, it proceeded. So I'm telling you that I'm trying to contrast for you that the spoken word with its blood was not powerful enough to bring into close proximity man with God as even in the shadow of it, which was seen in the Garden of Eden where God walked with them in the cool of the day. That still was an earthly realm. That still was not in the spiritual realm. But that that I'm speaking to you now as Him, John 1.1, 1, 1, having been manifest, the Word of God being manifest and made flesh, now he can be, His blood can be shed. He's flesh. Now, it's more than the spoken Word. It's the living Word made flesh with blood. Now, now we're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about Him coming down to the earth, manifest not only in spoken, but in actual physical presence with blood. So the spoken word could bring a man into justification by faith, as such as it did Abraham, such as it did David, such as it did Moses. But then it, all it could do is restore them to their realm, to the earthly realm. But through the word made flesh and man partaking of that atonement, attaining unto sons. Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. Attaining unto sons. And you'll catch the heart of God here if you look. You'll catch the heart of God, what he, was, what he is about, how he's glorifying himself through His Son. Because now that He's made flesh and He's shed His blood, the propitiation has now takes it out of the earthly realm and takes it into the heavenly realm. Now it takes Him out of an earthly being into the new creation being that is heavenly bound. <laughs> no longer in made in the image like Adam. Now He is a new creation in Christ. Oh, the beauty of it. Oh, the glorious beauty that if I was only capable how I could speak what I got in my heart and it would be so moving to all of us. If I could speak what it is that's rolling around in me articulately, it would be beautiful. But that's why God limits in this dust because I'd get in pride and I'd think I was really something. He limits me to this 500-word vocabulary and the stuttering, stammering lips, and that's all I got. But I fight myself because I'd love to just speak this in tongues. <laughs> it just wouldn't be, it wouldn't work for you. You wouldn't understand it, neither would I. But I could express it a lot better. 
I can express my thanksgiving, my awe, my honor of God uh, more fuller, I guess, more complete. And not even just sons of God. I said that Christ now made manifest in the flesh and pour His, pour his blood. Now instead of the sprinkling of the blood of the His, now it's the blood of Jesus Christ that we can enter in. Now it's about sons of God, Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. But it's not even just sons of God, little s. It's sons of God, big s. Sons of God, God had sons. He, he called His angels, even His fallen angels, sons of God. And Jesus re rebuked, rebuked the Jews by, when they said, you, you've called yourself God. You've made yourself to God. And He said, well, hasn't in your own word, doesn't it say in your own word that He has called His being sons of God? So there were, there were sons of God before this new creation, but there's never been sons of God like this new creation. Never. And they haven't, they haven't even manifest yet. Not one. Not one son of God is manifested. Save Yeshua. Save that one. He's the only one that has manifested as the Son of God. But He was the Son of God. He is still the Son of God. But the new creation, Son, capital S, of God in Christ, has not one of them been manifested. Well, that comes in the resurrection. It's a grand plan. It's about bringing sons of God into close proximity with Him in His heavenly realm. The new Jerusalem descending down above the earth. Who are those in that new Jerusalem? But the new creation sons of God who will be in close proximity with Him. There will be no temple for He is and the Son are the temple. You can't get into that place unless you have the new creation work in you. You can't even get in it. You can't. Why? Because no man can see God and live save a son of God. The son of God implies intimacy and oneness with God. John 17, Father, show them the love that you have for me that you also have for them. And that the union that you and I have, that you will bring them into the union that we together can be one. One in union, one in, in uh, proximity, one in purpose. That's God's salvation plan, not justification, not the law of Moses, not even the covering of the blood of Adam's sin, not just the remission of sin, but the bringing in sons of God through the Son of God. Not through the Messiah, Yeshua, as it relates. That's only, that, that doesn't make you a son of God. It makes you a child of God. To be born again doesn't make you a son of God. It makes you a child of God. It's like Curtis has said, come as you are, but you won't be what you are if you, if you come as you are. You will change. And this calling that Jesus and the ministry that Jesus now has is toward a calling of sons out of the earth, a living beings to become sons of God. Yeah, you've got to be justified to ever have an opportunity to become a son of God. But and once you're dead, you don't have the opportunity anymore. Only while you're alive and exercising faith in the Son of God, bringing glory to His name by good works in His name, can you qualify and be found worthy to be a son of God. That's a fact. Don't like it? Take it to God. It's the reality. It's the truth of the Scriptures. In that realm, in that realm, in that realm. Yeah, raised up out of this realm into that realm. 
being saved is a work of the word of God before the work of the manifest Son of God in the flesh. Did you hear me? I said being saved is a work of the word of God before the work of the manifested Son of God in the flesh. He saved Abraham. He saved Moses. He saved David. He saved Adam. He saved the uh, Lazarus. <laughs> he saved them. And they were found and witnessed to be in the scriptures in Abraham's bosom. He saved them. He saved them from the pit. He saved them from eternal fire. He saved them from eternal death. And that was a work before Christ ever became manifest in the Word. He was the spoken Word, wasn't he? <laughs> Old covenant participants comprehended and obtained by faith a participation in resurrection and restoration in earthly kingdom through the Almighty's Word. Seen and understood by Abraham, Moses, David, etc. Are you all following me in this? This is a rather uh, challenging message. Justification has, uh, has with it a limited quality of life. I've always said for years, when I, was, I remember, never forget the day where I was sitting and how it was that I was, what posture I was in and what I was asking God when he revealed to me the truth of the old covenant regeneration. And I've said for years that the old covenant regeneration resembled that of the new covenant regeneration, meaning the, the enlivening again of the spirit within man that had dried up and was in a state of separation from God, a state of death. And when that regeneration took place in the old covenant, it reinstated that spirit into a state of being that was enlightened, enlivened, charged with life. And then that regeneration that accompanies the new covenant faith in Jesus Christ, a like similar type of regeneration by the Spirit of God comes upon a man, enlivening, animating, bringing to life again that component of man, that third component, or first, spirit. And thereby, God then having an ability to commune and communicate again with that man. But that quality of life falls way short of the Son of God. Eternal life falls way short of the majesty of the Son of God. And the purposes that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit set about from when? That time is undesignated to the salvation of man, to the defeat of Satan, for the cleansing of the heavenly utensils of worship, to visit upon his enemies justice. All of those things are far above and exceed greatly just eternal life. Eternal life, as I've said it, is just not that meritous. But it is a better state of being than death, eternal death, of course. But justification only promises. It only holds forth in the Messiah of the world, eternal life. That's all it holds forth. Justification only holds forth that, which is a gift of God through Jesus Christ, to all the world. Not only to Israel, but to all the world. It is something that accompanied the old covenant. It is something that has been uh, extended and, and amplified in the new covenant. It's also wrought by faith in God. It, it cannot come, you cannot come to God through any other means than by faith. Faith in God. Faith in the Word. That's synonymous. Faith in the Word. Faith in God. You can't have one without the other. Both, both of those regenerations, both Old Covenant and New Covenant, both of those are accomplished by faith in God. Faith in His Word. 
But it's from a limited perspective. It's from a limited perspective that an old covenant believer or a new covenant believer stymied approaches God. Because he's revealed himself in the old covenant in a limited way. In a limited way, for he has only revealed himself in the old covenant in a limited way in that he is I am. That's how he revealed himself. I am. He didn't reveal himself in any other form as Christ has revealed him. He revealed him in the old covenant to Abraham, Moses, and the law as the I am. Jesus came to reveal God as the Father. And who can reveal God as a Father? But the Son. Who else could reveal God as a Father than the Son? Abraham and Moses revealed God as the covenant-making, law-giving, almighty I Am. Here is a new, totally new dynamic in the Son of God calling, far exceeding that calling. And that calling is from the Father, through Christ, to reveal to His creation man, He as the Father. Jesus declares Himself the Son of God, meaning I am equal with the Father. <laughs> I am equal with the Father. Yeah, the calling in the ministry, the calling. When I say calling, I mean, you know, it's like you're calling. Mike! <laughs> Mike! He's calling. He's call His calling is to brideship. He's, his ministry is to bring you into brideship by revealing the Father to us through Him, through Himself. It does. It, 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 is a, it is an opportunity that could not have been wrought under the I am or the Mosaic law. It's an opportunity only that was extended to the new covenant believer and or the highly faithful, 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 F-U-L-L, old covenant man such as Abraham. The Old Covenant knew not God as the Father, although it did declare Him in the plurality as Elohim. You, those of you who know anything about the Hebrew know that Elohim is a plural statement. When you describe God as Elohim, you describe Him as God's, G-O-D-S. And he said that, in the, and we quoted it already once in Genesis let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. That's Elohim. And then on, in the words of Isaiah, if you needed another confirmation in the words of Isaiah, he said, For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Us, plurality. Elohim. And as no man has ever seen God, the Father, who was it that Isaiah saw? It was the Son of God. And that Son of God was represented in the us who will, who will go for us. In the Son of God made flesh, crucified and resurrected, we may experience life. I am the truth, the way, and the life. But not just life, not regeneration life only, but life and life more abundantly. Beyond mere justification. That is, through Him in the New Covenant, the new creation experience of the inscribing of the Word of God upon the heart. That scripture where it says in Romans 5, 5, 
the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which given unto us. What is in view there answers to that future millennial promise to the Jewish nation of Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34, and Jeremiah 32, 40. You'll remember those scriptures where he said he will write upon their hearts the Torah. So that's a new covenant promise, a new covenant millennial promise to the Jewish nation when he brings them back into preeminence. But the new covenant believer scripture is that answers or has in view that same process by the Holy Spirit is him, the Holy Spirit, being shed abroad in our heart. Romans 5, 5. This being the new covenant call and means to the new creation sonship. He said, I tell you the truth, is it expedient for me to go? Jesus said to the disciples on this night of his Passover passion, the night before, the night that he was to be betrayed, betrayed by Judas, in that night, he said, I am going, and you can't follow me now. But I will, not send, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will send another. I will, the Father, I will pray, and the Father will send another comforter. It's expedient. It's the best thing that could happen is me going away for you. That in my laying down my soul unto death, and then raising it up again unto the resurrected life, in that the Holy Spirit may come and indwell you. And the way he said it there in John, I believe the 14th chapter, he said, for he dwelleth with you, meaning the Holy Spirit, but he shall be in you. Big difference. Big difference in the justification. Big difference in the regeneration. Big difference in sanctification. Big difference between Messiah and Son of God. He's Messiah. He was, they were already regenerated. They were already saved. But it was expedient for, them to, for Him to go that the Holy Spirit might come, that the Son of God might come into His ministry, that that which exceeded the Messiah, the Savior of the world, in making sons unto God. Through the activity of the Holy Spirit indwelling the new creation. That in laying my soul unto death, raising it up again into resurrected life, in that the Holy Spirit may come and indwell you. Jesus glorifies the Father. The Father glorifies the Son. Jesus glorifies the Father by bringing the power of the Holy Spirit to bear upon men's hearts. That the Father may delight in having a new company, that of brethren. Many sons, as I said, Hebrews 1 and 2. God delights in Christ, for Christ brings into being through His resurrected life, His obedient life on the earth, His sacrificial offering on the cross, His resurrection from among the dead. He brings into play a new creation, which he, now this new creation is a group that is called the Brethren. Their brethren. In this God delights. The Father glorifies the Son in that He was obedient un unto the enduring of this humiliating cross. He anoints Him now. He coronated Him now above all. Every knee. Every tongue. Both in heaven, on the earth, and in the earth bow and declare Him, God, worthy of praise and honor. The fifth chapter of Revelation, we have the angels themselves casting their crowns before His feet, giving up willingly, knowingly, to the majesty of Jesus Christ the Lamb, the authority in all heaven as extension to the earth. The glorious 
place that Jesus needs to be elevated into, our thinking is the Son of God. The law of Moses gave the ten imperfect commandments, didn't it? The law of Moses gave the ten imperfect commandments, and afterwards, the limiting blood was shed. The commandments were given, and Moses slew the animals, took the blood and scattered it, sprinkled it upon, not scattered it, but he sprinkled it upon all of Israel. But these were suitable to God's purposes at that time. What, what, is it, what was God's purposes in that time? That being that no man is justified by the law. That was God's purpose for the law. He made the law so that we might prove to us and we would see that no man could be justified by the law. The law was perfect in the sense of its commands and its demands. But it was imperfect in that the men that were given the law could not enact the law. And that is the purpose that it was given, that they could see that there was no man could be justified because by the law, for no man could keep the law. So it suited God's purposes at that time. Jesus gives a perfect new commandment. Jesus gives a perfect. Wherein the ten were imperfect, the one new command reflected the perfect in Christ. And that one new command, after that one new command, then therefore he shed his blood, the perfect blood. Not the animal blood sprinkled with it, but the one command he gave on this night of John in his passion, right the night before he was, was betrayed, he then gave his blood. He sealed what it is that he commanded. He gave the power to, to and the means by which they could keep the commandment in the gift of the Holy Spirit. that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Let me read that again. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. John 13, 14. The law of Moses commanded love God and your neighbor, didn't it? But is, this, is loving your neighbor as yourself... Is that the same as loving your brethren? The law of Moses commanded that love God, the love of God, and your neighbor as yourself. The word neighbor relating to all of those who, like you, had found themselves in the inheritance of the promised land. Are you with me? See, the, the command went to Israel. Israel was commanded to love God, right? And love your neighbor as you love yourself. That law had to do with the inheritance in the land. The neighbor was the neighbor in the land. Love your neighbor. He that is like you has an inheritance in the land, the promised land, Israel. They were like them in that they were redeemed like and received that inheritance themselves. Jesus commands to love the brethren. It's a little bit about, it's a little bit like leaving before the punchline. I told the whole joke but the last line. In other words, this is the significance of what I'm saying. Jesus commands to love the brethren, doesn't he? Love one another, to love the brethren. A love reflected of the love of the Son and the Father. I'm trying to contrast for you the love of the old covenant, the loving of God and your neighbor as yourself with loving the brethren. Loving the brethren is someone that's a sibling. 
someone who is, is not you. It's, it's closer to you than your neighbor. A sibling is one in your own house. A brother has that connotation of a relation. And it has the connotation of the father and the son. The love of the brethren. Closer than a neighbor. Greater in inheritance. It, it had not to do... This love has not to do with the neighbor because he got an inheritance in the land, the promised land with you. It was a love of your brethren with a greater inheritance, the heavenly inheritance. Are you with me? I'm, trying, I'm doing my best at contrasting these two, these commands of love. It was imperfect. It had an imperfect sacrifice. It had an imperfect man. He had not the efficacy over in the Old Covenant to come to pass, for God gave it for His own purposes, that no man should be justified by the law. But in the New Covenant, it is not the same dynamic. In the New Covenant, it's a law that is we are held accountable to as it relates to sanctification, as it relates to being a son of God. It's a new accountability that says, commands a love your brethren, and it's with the power of the Holy Spirit and the efficacy of the blood of Jesus, we have the capabilities to love the brethren. And the love of the brethren is reflective of the love that Jesus has for the Father. And the Father has for Jesus. And they together had love for the disciples together. It's the same type of love. And a greater inheritance. It's a greater inheritance because it's befitting a different spear. Sphere. A different spear wherein they were the promises of the new covenant lift us. Out of the earthly promises into those heavenly promises. 1 John 3, 10 through 17 gives you the dynamic. It says how, you know, the way it ends up there at 17 is how is it that you can say the love of the Father is within you if you give not to your brother who is in need. And then finally, I'm about finished. In this dynamic, God is glorified. In this dynamic of us actively participating in the Holy Spirit, bringing ourselves through the power of the Spirit into relationship with the Father as Christ has revealed Him to us, this dynamic brings glory to God, brings glory to the Father. It brings glory to the Son. Jesus commends His disciples unto the Father's love and keeping in John 17. He commands them beyond the power of themselves alone. As the word is not to love as you love yourself, as it was in the old covenant, but the love as I loved you. Do you see it? In, in the new covenant command of Jesus, that perfect, he says that you have loved one for another as I have loved you. It's not as yourself love but love as I loved you. you got to let that soak in just a moment. One being conditional love and one being unconditional. Both are unconditional and both are conditional. In that you have to participate in the love of the brethren and that love that God will extend is conditioned, the love of the father to a son, is conditioned on whether you love the brethren. We have a hard time with that. We have a hard time thinking that God conditions his love. But he does condition his love. Not only does he condition his love, he loves others more than he loves some. Well, I know that really goes against the grain of some, because we all want to think in terms of God loves us all the same. But the reality is that we find in the new covenant is that Jesus loved others more than he loved others. John the beloved. Okay? You know, I mean, get, you get me off into that. I don't, that's not where I was going to go. But I'm just saying, to, to think that God's love is unconditional 
in either the Old Covenant or the New Covenant is a misnomer. Because all of God's love is con- as it relates to sonship, not as God already put everybody in unconditional love as they were a being in the world. He said God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So God unconditionally loved the world with a love, but the condition to, to get into the love of God was to receive Jesus as the Son, as the Messiah. You didn't receive the Messiah, you weren't saved. Does that mean that God didn't love you? No, it had to do with your will. You rejected that that God offered unconditionally, save you believe it and receive it. And it's the same in the New Covenant sonship promise that if you are found worthy, worthy, worthy meaning watchful, awake, prayerful, faithful, loving, then you are qualified. So there's no unqualified love that will bring all into sonship. And as I said, God is creator. God can do as he chooses, and he finds no injustice in loving some more than others. And who is it that he loves more? Those that love him more. David was a man after his own heart. He, see, it, it is still in our, it's still in our uh, realm of possibilities to, to be loved by God more, and that is to love him more and honor him more. His whole uh, economy is based on, on authorities that have to do with faithfulness and holiness and loving. <laughs> That's the word. I know it's contrary. It sounds contrary to our ears because we're so used to hearing some other contrary to the word message. Yes, Debbie? Uh, when you're contrasting uh, love others um, as I have loved you, it compares the Old Covenant where it says um, love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, it's easier in the Old Testament, I mean, under that law, love others yourself, like don't kill them, don't covet, and blah, blah, blah. But in the New Covenant, love is I love you, and he gave all. And like the early church, they gave all to each other. I mean, all, you know. I, I do know, and you're, you, you hit on my next paragraph. You're, you're uh, parroting, uh, actually you're not parroting, I'm going to be parroting you, in that that's exactly what I say in the next paragraph. Well, it, it said, Jesus commends his disciples under the Father's love, and it says the word is not to love as, you're, as you love yourself, but as I have loved you love. You know, not as the old covenant, love your neighbor as yourself. Now it is in the new covenant, love your brethren as I have loved you. Love. And Jesus loved them as the Father directed, and he loved them more than himself. Isn't that the word? The word, he loved them more than himself. As he gave up his life for them. And this is exactly what W is saying. We ought, or, or even it goes beyond we ought, it is commanded that we also give up our lives. One for another. See, The love of the brethren as Christ, you love your brethren as I loved you, requires you to die for your brethren. It's no longer love your neighbor as yourself. It's not even as easy as loving your brethren. It's love your enemies. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it even exceeds, it exceeds the loving of your brethren into the, and laying down your life for your brethren in that you would love the world. He, he loved the world. And I suppose, well, as I said, it's not, a, it's not an optional, really, it, because we're talking about, again, we're talking about sons of God, qualifying to be sons of God, bride of Christ. We're not talking about being born again. We're not talking about being justified. We're talking about excelling in the kingdom, being found worthy as a bride. The, these are the things, that these are the dynamic, this is the dynamic those that would want to attain unto that place must walk in to attain unto that place. All I'm doing is revealing and laying out for us the choices uh, and defining the difference between just being merely born again 
and inheriting that full salvation that's in, not that goes beyond the Messiah of the world into the Son of God calling and ministry. This, in, this, in this love is what? In this love is our distinguishing mark. They will know you by the love one for another. Wherein the circumcision of the old covenant was, was the mark of the old covenant participant. The new covenant participant is in the circumcision of the heart in the love for the brethren. This is the seal. This is the mark. And I don't know that I see that much, do you? I know you don't see it that much out of me. I know that I would that you would. But that I would that you would see me in that light. But I can't say hocus pocus and wave some magic wand before your eyes and make you think that way against your practical, common, or even spiritual sense. I fall short in, in most everything that I minister I, I know that my heart is to, is to reflect love for the brethren. But I, I know that that's, and give up my life for them. But I know that, that I, I, I haven't reached that. I have, that's, that's my goal, but I'm working, and I'm working for that on a daily basis. I'm not slack in it. I, I listen to the Holy Spirit. I let him uh, rebuke me, and I, I yield, and I repent, and I change so oh, so thus we see the manifest indwelling of the spirit in Peter who thought he was in want of nothing having been saved you remember there in 13th chapter not you're not gonna wash me uh, yeah if you don't wash you then you have no part in my kingdom well, well Lord I you know I'll die for you and and he said, hey, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. He could have said, before the cock crows, you're going to deny and curse and deny me. you know. But he, he softened it up a little. But where was Peter in his thinking? He's just where most merely born-again Christians are. Oh, not me. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good right here like I am. The state I'm in, I'm good. I don't need whatever it is that you're preaching, this salad of words. I don't need it. <laughs> yeah, proud, yeah, the combination of proud humility. Okay, okay, Jesus, I'll take your word for it. Had Jesus not washed his feet, he would have went the way of Judas. Jesus washed his feet, prayed for him, brought him into his kingdom, representing the, 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 the washing of that that was left on him and the gift of the Holy Spirit that was to be poured out. So it was the contrasting where... The, uh, the indwelling of the Spirit in Peter, who thought he was want for nothing, but then he's now cooperating and contrasted in this on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, he now courageously speaks in terms of once he has received the manifest uh, uh, Holy Spirit, but it wasn't just as we think often that it was like a, a switch of a light switch and that on the day of Pentecost then he became this different Peter. We forget that there was this 40 day period where he was at in the presence of Christ resurrected and that he heard this dialogue between Christ and the Father talking to them and explaining and, and bringing to their mind all the prophetic word that, the, that he had fulfilled and, and sharing with them that their ministries were what they were. All of that 40 days of the, the spoken word with the presence of the resurrected Christ is a lot. There was a lot of dynamic change from, from the, that resurrection day, Sunday, uh, through, throughout the 40 days, 10 days before Pentecost. So when, when the Holy Spirit did fall, and Peter was filled, he was full of the Word of God. He had been praying and fasting and waiting and meditating on all the things that Christ had said before and after the resurrection. So there's a great contrast there, but it, it was an empowering where now he is, has a selfless fear in the message that he presented. You, Israel, sinners, have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, his his. His blood is on your hands. You're, the guilt, you're full of the guilt. He, he did not pull any punches. And thus we can see in our own selves that 
uh, as, we, as we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. We've been raised up out of this rudiments of this darkened world, and out of its thinking, uh, into a heavenly sphere of light and life and bread. And we must begin to see ourselves not only capable of loving the Father and our brethren, but greatly accountable to do so. And that in the power of Jesus Christ's revelation in Him being the way and the truth and the life. He's the standard. He's the standard that we should live unto if we are going to inherit in His glory. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you for coming. Father, in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Yeshua, I pray for this group, both that are here in earshot and those that are extended, those that, uh, that we call members or brethren here of this ecclesia, this small group, I pray for them as well. I lift them up and I ask that you, you would divinely intervene in their well-being and that you would elevate us in our thinking as it relates to Jesus Christ, that you'd grant us by the Spirit a renewed mind and eyes to see and ears to hear the word and rightly divide it and let that the majesty of and the reverence of Christ grow in our hearts that we we might draw upon that when we are faced with the temptations the trials and the tests of this world grant us Lord that answer that manifest prayer of Christ in that Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Allow us, Father God, to continue in life. Touch our bodies and be merciful to us, Lord. And keep us from any uh, illness that would steal from us or rob from us our abilities to qualify for the kingdom of Christ. That, that, uh, that is, is at the front of our prayers, Lord. Not selfishly do we pray for life, but we pray... That, that we pray for life that we might gain unto this abundant life. And we need time. Lord, we've got a long way to go. We're, we recognize we're falling way short of where we ought to be. We know you can do a lot in a short time. And so if our time is short, we ask you to do a lot. But even if you do a lot in a short time, we still could have more fruit if you let us live more time. So let us, Lord, come to the conclusions of our, uh, of our reason to be living and to having had accepted the Son of God into our life, and that is to bear fruit, to bring glory to the Father, and that we might in ourselves inherit the promises. Father, again, I, I, I just say it again. Let these people that, that we have covered with prayer, that you've put together in unity, this group, and you know whoever that is that... that that speaks to but I ask again that your your divine life would flow into us and keep us from any debilitating or sudden death or exemption out of this life that excludes us from the kingdom have mercy Lord God in the name of Jesus we pray amen y'all agree with that yes. father especially us older people we we just got all kinds of issues that uh, tell us every day that our time is growing short. Yeah, uh, well, I know that young people ought to feel that same way, but somehow you have put this into force to, to really bring the point home, the graying of hair and the et cetera, et cetera. So, Lord, we ask you again for your mercy here. Uh, we want to finish the race. We want to run right through that tape strong. We don't want to fall. We don't want to fail. Strengthen us, Lord, that we would not lose heart, we'd not give up, and not, not only that, Lord, that you would energize us. Energize us, Lord, to the good. And not only us, let us, let, let us be, have that seal, that mark, 
the love of the brethren, so that, that even our own families could see a difference in us. Well, they, they have the love of Jesus. They, they truly do have something that I would want. Let us really be those witnesses. Let us really testify of you, Lord, not looking for arguing about names and, and genealogies and silly stuff, but, but 